When you live in the middle of nowhere, you have to get used to certain things. When you live in a town like Prodigy, that only gets more true. Sometimes a cow will go missing from a field in the middle of the night. Other times, someone will come across a roadkill, strung out across the length of the road, from one ditch to another, with pieces missing. Occasionally, when people leave their trucks in the two tracks in the middle of fields during harvest, they would come back to a tipped truck or even ruined tires. The town, officially, chalked it up to some naughty city kids, or even some of the teenagers in town, running around and wreaking havoc. Unofficially, we all knew something else was going on, but no one had ever seen it. There's always a story, though, especially in Prodigy. I guess it was only a matter of time before someone ran into it. The night we first saw the thing in the fields, it started out like any other. I was only 15 at the time, but Oliver was 16, with a full driver's license and everything. I don't know if you know anything about what teenagers in small towns do for fun, but if you do, then you probably know that the number one pastime is to get in a car with your friends and cruise until you run out of gas. All we had in Prodigy were fields and long, winding dirt roads, so it made sense to put them to use. Most of the time, we would blast music over the stereo, buy some snacks at the gas station and joke around all night. Sometimes we would drive out past the houses, way past the feedlot, and park somewhere on the side of the road before climbing up on top of Oliver's truck and looking at the stars. The only difference, I assume, is that kids in Prodigy are usually a little more aware of where they are and what's around them when they're out in the middle of a field after dark. Prairie kids around here know that, usually, you aren't the only thing out there. Most of the time it's just a deer or a loose cow, or even a coyote. Sometimes it's not. You just learn how to be careful, and you usually don't go by yourself. At this time in my life, it was nice to get away sometimes, laying in the middle of Oliver's truck or climbing up on top, and looking at the stars while we blasted classic rock through the open windows was a preferable way of spending my time. Usually, Jay and Logan would come with us, and the four of us would have a blast out there by ourselves until we absolutely had to go home. That night, though, it was just me and Oliver as we drove through town, past the still inexplicably scorched site of the old church, and coasted around what felt like a hundred different dirt roads. Jay was babysitting, Logan had work, normal stuff. We weren't exactly bothering to be quiet. The last house we had passed was at least ten miles back, probably more. We had settled into our routine of playing music through the truck stereo as we got comfortable on the blankets that I had brought in the bed of Oliver's truck, talking and yelling jokes and howling in laughter. His stereo had Bluetooth, so we could listen to whatever we wanted through his phone without having to climb around a million times to change the radio station or rotate CDs. We did leave the window at the back of his truck open, though, mostly so we could snake a phone charger through it. We sat in the bed of his truck for nearly an hour before I started to feel weird about something. I like to think that, in most situations, I have pretty good intuition. My mom has always described me as a good judge of character, but I'm not sure that's all it is. Maybe I'm just more aware of my surroundings and what's going on than the average person. Or maybe I'm totally normal and my friends just don't pay attention. Whatever it is, sometimes I get this feeling. Oliver calls it my spidey senses. It's like a little buzzing voice somewhere in the back of my brain that makes me want to look around and make sure nothing is going on. And there that feeling was, creeping up my spine, making it feel like someone's breath was hot on the back of my neck. A familiar, buzzing alertness settling in the back of my head. Something's moving. Pay attention. Tearing my attention away from Oliver, who was deep in the middle of a story about some crazy nightmare he had a few nights previously. I turned my head to survey the dark, endless wheat fields on both sides of the parked truck. Most of the time, it alerts me to nothing more than an animal quietly wandering around, but I usually figure that it never hurts to check. The truck's engine was off, but the keys were in the ignition, and turned so that the lights in the truck were on, illuminating a neat little circle around us and shining dimly a couple feet into the fields on each side of the truck. With the gentle wind, it all looked like a vast, waving ocean, separated in the center by a pale dirt road 
that disappeared into the inky blackness outside of our little haven of light. I used to love the way tall grass and wheat fields looked when they were blowing in the breeze. Uniform waves flowing back and forth. I couldn't see anything of interest on the left side of the road, closest to where Oliver was sitting. So I turned my head to look over my shoulder at the field on the right side of the road instead. Oliver kept talking, knowing me well enough by now to let me do my thing. It seemed to be the same thing on that side too. Nothing of interest. Until something, nearly at the bottom of my field of vision, caught my attention. It was just a subtle movement. Nothing crazy. But it was a big enough break in the smooth waving pattern of the field that it caught my eye. It wouldn't exactly be uncommon for an animal to have wandered out into the middle of a field though. Especially not this far from town where animals had a bit more free reign. If an animal, like a deer or a cow, had somehow gotten past its fence and wandered out this far, we would have seen it clearly above the growing wheat. It hadn't grown tall enough yet to obscure anything that big. Anything smaller, like a rabbit or fox, would be able to slip around without us seeing it though. That's probably why, at first, I wasn't too concerned. Oliver had finally paused his story, leaning a bit closer to me and my side of the truck to try and figure out what I was looking at. I apologized and explained that I was still listening. I just thought I saw something. It's probably just a fox or a raccoon out in the field. I saw, even though I couldn't quite find it in me to tear my eyes away from the field. By this point, the waves of movement in the field were uniform again, giving the impression that whatever had been moving had stopped. I don't see anything, Oliver said, staring off into the distance and squinting his eyes like it might help him see better. I don't either. I just thought I saw something moving around in the field. I shook my head and leaned back, settling down in the blanket again. Probably a raccoon or something. With a sigh and quick shake of my head, I turned back around and faced Oliver. He eyed me for a second but didn't say anything and launched right back into his story. Honestly, if we got freaked out every time a rabbit or a deer interrupted us by wandering around in the dark, we would never finish anything. Even though I had turned my attention back to Oliver, it was half-hearted at best. I couldn't shake the buzzing feeling in the back of my head, and even though I hadn't seen anything or been given an actual reason to be scared, it was starting to make me anxious. I had no reason to believe it was anything but an animal, but the fact I hadn't seen the animal was bugging me. I was so caught up in my head that I almost missed the subtle noises in the field behind me. My eyes shot back to the field, abruptly interrupting Oliver's story. I tried to listen closer, but the music from the stereo was too loud. I waved my hand at Oliver a few times, hoping he might read my mind and get the hint, before I leaned closer to him and was able to grab his arm. Wait. I patted my hand on his arm once or twice, furrowing my brow as I looked from him to the field and back to him again. Turn your music down. Pause it or something. Oliver reached for his phone, which was lying face down on the blanket in front of him, and pressed pause. I almost immediately wished I hadn't asked him to do so. The noise we heard once the music was off was loud, much louder than I thought, and sent a slow shiver up my spine once I could hear it clearly. I couldn't pinpoint from where in the field it was coming from. It sounded like it was in front of us and behind us all at once. It was a low, pitiful groaning sound, coupled with a sharp chittering noise, like someone was moaning through chattering teeth. If it was an animal, it sounded in pain, but something told me it wasn't an animal. Above it all, there was silence. We could hear no bugs, no other animals, nothing else. Oliver, I whispered, swallowing dryly, my hand still on his arm. Please tell me you can hear that. With my sights trained on the field again, I strained my eyes, looking in the same spot I had seen the movement last time, only to find a sharp movement in the ditch, at the edge of the road, catch my eye. I nearly jumped out of my own skin, turning my head to get a look. The tall grass in the ditch right by the side of the road was swaying, maybe a foot away from where the light from the truck ended, and then it was on the road. It was too dark that far down the road behind us to truly see what was crawling through the dirt, but if the clumsy, skittery movements of its limbs flashing just out of reach of the circle of light were anything to go by, it wasn't any kind of animal I had ever seen. We realized too late, as it was pulling itself into the left field 
and rustling through the wheat that whatever that thing was, it was circling us, stalking, hunting. For a moment after it disappeared, the wheat stood still, and everything was silent. Oliver and I were frozen. My ears were straining to hear anything aside from my own terrified breathing, dreading the sound of low, dry moaning or teeth chattering together. What followed the stillness were a series of dry, clumsy vocalizations, garbled and uncomfortable to hear. I twisted my fingers in the fabric of Oliver's jacket, scared halfway out of my mind. It sounded hollow, like someone, something, was trying to wrap its mouth around words that didn't quite fit. We listened for a second in horror as the noises grew louder, and then we realized it was trying to speak. Oliver. A drawn out, twisted version of what sounded like Oliver's name called to us from the ditch, coupled with a hollow sound of slowly gnashing teeth. It tried again, voice scratchy and pained. Oliver, pause it. A deep, gravely groan punctuated the deeply wrong attempt at a sentence, and I came to a cold realization. It was listening to us. Not only that, it was mimicking us, mimicking me. Next to me, Oliver whispered a sharp expletive under a shaky exhale. Climb through the window. I whispered through clenched teeth, my breath catching in my throat as I tried not to panic. Start the truck. I released his arm, my fingers burning from how hard I had been gripping the fabric of his jacket. Oliver said nothing, but I was answered with the same sharp, shockingly loud chittering noise from earlier. Oliver leaned forward onto his knees, reaching out with shaky fingers to grab onto the open window at the back of his truck. I thanked whatever God might be listening that Oliver had always been a skinny kid. He could at least fit through the window. Oliver. String the syllables together, sounding more like a person with every passing second. The thing in the field groaned and chattered away as Oliver slowly pulled his body through the window. Oliver. I was too scared to move. I didn't want to try climbing in through the window for fear for taking my eyes off the section of grass where I had last seen movement, and I was absolutely not about to get out of the bed and try to go around to get into the passenger seat. I wasn't moving or taking my eyes off of the field until we were off this godforsaken road. Please, tell me you can hear that. I stared into the dark as a pitchy, dry version of my own voice bounced back at me and had practiced my words until I could string them all together. The sentence was choppy, stilted, and the emphasis was off but it sounded like me. Whatever it was started to slowly creep through the wheat that was hiding it so well. I could make out the path it took, following the sideways parting of wheat, standing out from the rest which was barely moving now, that the breeze had died down. It moved slowly, after the way skittered across the road. I knew it was intentional. The movement was nearly lined up with the side of the truck now, as Oliver pulled his legs through and finally flipped around, getting situated in the front seat as quickly as he could. I watched the subtle movement grow closer to the fence. If it passed the fence, all that would be in the way of it getting to us was a shallow ditch, and I had a feeling that wouldn't do much to stop it. The sound of the engine starting up nearly made me cry. Oliver wasted no time in stomping on the gas as soon as the engine started up, and he could throw it and drive. Over the sound of the engine and the tires throwing gravel, I could distinctly hear the sound of quickly gnashing teeth, and as we peeled out and quickly picked up pace, the thing shot forward through the ditch. As it did, I saw distant flashes of dirty, peeling, rotting skin, like it was bubbling up and flaking right off of its bones. As it reached the ditch and scrambled for the road, I saw its hand, and that was enough for me. Without thinking, I reached through the window and into the cab and slammed my hand up into the lights, switching them off. I didn't want to see whatever was going to come crawling out of that field. It only half worked. As we sped away... I could see the vague shape of it behind us on the road, racing to catch us. It seemed so much bigger than I thought, and if we hadn't been in a truck, we never would have been able to outrun it. Its movement seemed clumsy, almost, but it didn't seem to have any trouble running around after us. Eventually, we lost it. Our speed outmatched it, and it fell behind with a series of growling moans. As soon as I couldn't see it anymore... I felt safe enough to climb back into the cab of the truck through the window. 
I wasn't going to ask Oliver to stop or pull over so I could climb into the seat regularly. Neither of us said anything as we turned the corner and took the fastest way back to town that we could. I stared at the dash barn, the image of a mangled, rotting hand with cut up, bleeding fingers reaching through the grass burned into my mind. There were a few stories floating around town for the next week. Apparently, along the road where we had been parked, something had ripped entire sections of fence out of the ground, snapping the wire and breaking the wood posts. The whole area of wheat and grass was destroyed, trampled into the earth. I don't like thinking about what could have happened if we hadn't been in a truck, or what could have happened to Oliver, or anyone else, if they had been alone when that thing started mimicking voices. And I prefer not to think about the fact that it had been hunting us, probably the whole time we had been parked on that road. We avoid that area now. I wonder sometimes if that thing is still mad that its prey got away.